Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do pretty much every Sunday. You can ask gardening questions down in the comment section below this video, and that's where I pick from them each week. I think I've written down 27 from last week, and uh, that's pretty typical. Uh, there are a lot more questions than that, uh, and I appreciate everyone's participation in the uh, videos because without you, there isn't a subscriber question and answer video. Uh, this past week, um, or by the time this video is going up, uh, the folks that are that own the Learn to Garden video series uh, should have a video on uh, landscaping for your area, just the differences in you know, different types of areas across the country, and um, you know how, how I think about landscaping them. And then there's a video with odd jobs from earlier in the week. There's some drone footage of the uh, wood chips going out here. We had a big load of wood chips. We received. It's as I'm filming this on Friday, uh, less than a week. I think it was Friday. I think it was actually Friday uh, afternoon. So we were five days. Got that pile off the driveway. It was a big giant pile. I've done all the paths. Done an area back in the back uh, edges of the woods where the new fence is going. I've stored some back here uh, and done the new beds on the front foundation as well. So uh, those wood chips. Um, we made quick work of that and we've got mulch coming on Monday. You're watching this on Sunday. Uh, triple shredded hardwoods coming on Monday. So the beds out here should look pretty good uh, by the middle of the week. Hopefully I'll have that out depending on rain and other such things. And then there'll be another odd job video going up from all these other odd jobs that we've had going on uh, to get to this point. And then there was a video with 50 small shrubs uh, that went up middle of the week 50 plus i think it was like 57 different shrubs that stay small and compact this uh, purple daydream laura petalum was on that list and several of the other plants that i'm surrounded by here on the uh, back uh, the back steps here in this video uh, were in that video uh, and then a video on uh, bradford pears actually not so much the bradford pear but the calorie hybrid calorie pear that the bradford pear kind of be has become and it's coming up everywhere all over the city of Raleigh and pretty much everywhere we drive uh, this time of year. We see them blooming in the woods uh, all over the place. And so that a, a video on that, uh, I think there's going to be a video right in the first of the week transplanting a pretty big shrub off the front foundation to a friend's house. Just the how to transplant shrub kind of video. Uh, and then next week in this video, I have an announcement to make. There are a few announcements that are gonna take place over the course of this spring, and one of them will be uh, next uh, Sunday uh, for something we've been putting together for the last few weeks uh, as well. Okay, let's jump to some questions. Again, I got 27 from this uh, past week, uh, making sure the, uh, the video is recording. It's on my phone right here as well. I can see, I can see what it looks like um, on my phone. Let's see. Uh, Somebody has a swampy area in their backyard and they wanted to know if they could fill it with wood chips. Since I had those wood chips behind me in last week's video, the pile on the driveway, uh, they wanted to know if they could use them to fill in a low area or a swampy area. I wouldn't do that. They really, all that organic material won't break down very well in a wet, swampy area. It's, you know, beneficial bacteria and, you know, uh, fungi need uh, air typically to break these organic things down properly. So if you go back there and bury it really deep. Now, the one thing you could do is make an elevated pathway through a wet area using wood chips. And all of my paths back here in the back garden, and I, I had included that in that Odd Jobs video this week. Uh, the wood chips allow, because they're free, they allow me to really put them in here pretty deep. And, uh, and that allows the pathways to kind of be elevated over the beds a little bit and the water to drain into those other areas. So if you wanted just a, you know, again, a pathway to get through that area, uh, and then you would plant plants that were appropriate for wetter conditions in that area, you could make it pretty interesting uh, that way. Um, using proper plants and then using the wood chips as a path uh, to, to, to navigate it uh, would be one way to design a space like that. Um, Will, gar uh, will the uh, before and after uh, videos return? So last year I did a series of videos where you guys, uh, subscribers sent in photos of before and after uh, photos from their garden. Yes, they absolutely will return. I did like, uh, gosh, there's like eight or so or nine that I put up uh, and I still have a ton of emails from you guys. I appreciate all of your participation in that. At some point, I typically, 
when we're home like this, we're getting a lot of things done out here in the garden and those before and after videos, I, I kind of save a little bit for if I'm traveling some. So that's when they, that's probably when they'll pop up uh, more often than not. If you're interested in sending in, if you weren't part of this and you're interested in sending in before and after video, uh, before and after photos uh, of your garden, you can send them to this uh, email address right here, horttube at gmail.com, and I'll add them to the list. But I probably still have 150 plus emails, not, not an exaggeration of, of great photos, and they weren't ranked in any way, shape, or form. So nobody's has been not put up because they weren't impressive. It just, you know, that, that's the order that I, I kind of just went through them and did them uh, as I had received them. Uh, so, you uh, no, there will definitely be more of them and pr probably quite a few before this year's over. I really like doing those videos. I love seeing your guys' garden. Uh, and I think that'll be part of one of the announcements uh, before this season is over as I'm, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about that later. Okay, do we do, will we do anything to protect our young landscape from invading cicadas? So this year, apparently there are, uh, you can look this map up. Um, there are cicadas that uh, s have a 17-year cycle. So they 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 wake up, they do their thing, and then they go back under the un they lay their brood and 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 they lay basically dormant for 17 years, and then wake up, and then they're 13-year broods. Sometimes, occasionally, for whatever reason, they've waken up a couple years early, a couple times recently, and so they're they're. Their schedule seems to be a little bit off for who knows what reason that going on there. But this particular season, I think it just happens to coincide that two broods are waking up at the same time. So there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of them. If you look at where we are on the map here in Raleigh, though, it doesn't look like it's going to be particularly uh, all, the, all that bad. But back into the Midwest, I think, is where um, uh, they're going to be doubled up on. I always wonder... You know, between 17 years since those, um, since that particular brood uh, of cicadas, you know, were there, how much human activity has damaged them in some way or another uh, during that period of time through agriculture and horticulture and, you know, spraying various chemicals and, uh, and other activities. I wonder if the numbers are still you know, as high as they even, as, as high as they were before, which is an inter interesting question. But uh, no, I don't think though it's going to be that big of an issue here. And I probably wouldn't do anything anyway. It's a quick hit. You know, they're, they're going to come through and eat a lot of stuff and then they're going to just kind of be gone. And most of that kind of damage is not the kind of damage, um, you know, that's going to uh, typically destroy these ornamental plants. Um, it's just going to temporarily, uh, temporarily damage them. Okay, so uh, somebody has a nine to 10 foot tall osmanthus with less growth uh, down near the bottom. Should they hard prune it uh, to get more bottom growth? So we had uh, over here, our orange flowering osmanthus is in a little too much shade and it was thin initially and it's still kind of a little bit thin down toward the bottom if you watched any of the pruning videos. But all I did with it was cut about a foot of growth off the top of it the middle of the season last year and it filled in quite a bit. Before you go, so yes, you can hard prune it. If it's been there for a while, it'll come back from that. Uh, but you might be, be better off just trying, as it's finishing flowering right now, because ours are still flowering a bit, as it's finishing fl finishing flowering, might be best to just take like a foot off of it or two feet off of it and try that first uh, and see if that has any impact on creating some new growth uh, down in the bottom of it without doing the whole complete reset thing. Uh, maybe try a more gentle approach the first time. Okay, somebody has a leaning five foot Spartan juniper. This was on the list of questions from last week and for some reason I just skipped it. Um, leaning, uh, they have a leaning five foot tall Spartan juniper. Should they dig around it uh, to straighten it up? Um, I don't know without seeing something like that how I would handle it. If it hasn't been in the ground very long, um, and the entire root ball is on a lean, uh, then yeah, I would dig it up to stand it back up. But if it's just at a lean, like the root, like the root ball went in flat and then it leaned from the top, you know, from above the ground, that you'll just do with a stake. You wouldn't need to do any digging around it. I wouldn't sink one side of the root ball 
uh, to deal with it. But yes, if it if you planted it, if you if you planted it, and then the root ball itself turned sideways, slightly sideways, yeah, that's something you dig to fix, right? But if you um, but if just the top of the plant itself bent over above the root ball, you would just you would use a stake to do that. I talked about some staking in a tree video last week or the week before. There's a couple of things on permanent stakes uh, out here in this garden. Uh, so, but yeah, you, you're probably going to end up staking it rather than digging around it. Uh, so somebody asked if it's just in general. I got a couple of chip drop wood chip questions because I was standing in front of the wood chip pile last week. Um, they wanted to know about invasive tree seeds uh, in the chip drop uh, there in Florida. It, every single time I put down any kind of mulch, I'm always going to get concerns, whether it's wood chips or hardwood mulch or whatever it is. Termites. Um, am I worried about termites? Am I worried about diseases from the trees? Am I worried about seed? Am I worried about poison ivy? Am I worried about this? Am I worried about that? I, I just don't spend any of my time um, worrying about it. Um, I just don't. Most of, If it was a diseased maple that came down somewhere in all likelihood you know that disease is very specific to that maple and it's not going to hurt anything that's with it you know in this garden uh, uh, generally speaking and you know I, don't, I just i just don't spend a whole lot of time thinking you know trying to trying to find any negativity in it at, at all you know every single time that i have put down wood chips and whatever species of wood has come um, and I'm sure at this point with all the wood chips I've ever used, because um, I actually used them back at the nursery as well when we took down trees there uh, for some planting beds to start those. Uh, I even used wood chips at the, at the garden center up on the corner uh, one, uh, one time as well when some trees got taken down there. So I've used them for a long time. I've never had any negative issue whatsoever. I mean, if you, poison ivy could be in it you know, for sure. So if you're very sensitive to that, for sure, you're going to, you know, want to wear gloves and that kind of thing when you're handling it. Uh, but termites, I'm not worried about at all. I mean, termites, uh, termites in a pile of wood chips would be doing the thing that wood termites are on the planet for, which is breaking down decaying wood. Uh, you know, there, there are termites out here everywhere, uh, whether I have wood chips in these pot in these paths or, or not. You know, they're just literally everywhere. This is a wooded area behind me. Every single time a tree falls back there, you know, termites are going to move into it at some, on some part of that tree and start breaking it down. They're like the, you know, the, the beginning group that comes in and starts breaking it down before the earthworms and the other things, you know, get a shot at it <laughs> later on. So they're just everywhere and there's not much I can do about that. I mean, I'm not going to pile them up on the side of the house, you know, for sure, uh, to invite them into the house. But I don't worry about any of those things. It's a long list of questions that I get that are worries about these materials that we cover the ground with around our houses. You know, and if you have those concerns and you know you wanted to avoid them completely, you'd you'd probably use some sort of rock mulch closer to the house, uh, and then you know these mulches away from it. I just have never had any issues whatsoever over the 38 years. I was thinking about that the other day, 30, 38 years since I started a job in horticulture. And then before that was a, um, um, you know, I did a, I go, what have I, what have, what have I called it? Um, uh, uh, involuntary farming, uh, before that. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, on a uh, tobacco farm, somebody has a declining, uh, blue spruce, that is 25 feet tall and they, it's used as a screen. Should they plant something near it to take over as it declines? And they were pointed out Leyland Cypress as an option. I would probably avoid Leyland Cypress in general. A lot of the Leylands here in our area, especially, I see very few old, healthy Leyland Cypress hedges uh, at this point, and they used to just be everywhere. Green Giants are replacing them like crazy. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll figure out a way to overdo it with green giants uh, soon enough. Uh, but yeah, you could go ahead and plant something near it. You have to make, you have to think about how is that 25 foot blue spruce going to come out of there? You know, if you plant something near it, is that going to prevent someone you're hiring or you from being able to take it out in the future when it's ready to come down and when it's ready to be retired from that space? Um, is it easier to take it down now and then plant something 
you know, then later. So you got to navigate how you're going to take it out later uh, and prevent yourself from having to make that decision at some point because uh, you probably don't want a 25 foot tall blue spruce falling. You'd probably, you'd probably rather have it cut down with a purpose so, so that you know where it's going to drop. So somebody has a um, beauty berry. Uh, it lost all its leaves and looks dead. Um, any hope of it surviving 7B Virginia. Beauty berries go dormant in the wintertime. So, um, you know, this is, this is a great question to throw out because a lot of people that are new uh, to gardening, you know, if you go and buy something and it's covered in leaves, covered in berries, maybe covered in flowers, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden, it's not any of those things. Uh, uh, you know, is it dead uh, is, is, is a good question. Uh, no, it's very probably very much alive. And uh, I just pruned ours back to uh, less than a foot tall out in the front garden. That's how much abuse those things uh, can take. You can go out there and scratch. If you're concerned if anything is dead, you can always go and just like this you, I think you can see how flexible that is. Um, you know, that, that's a sign of life. And then I can scratch, you know, with my thumbnail along the bark and see a little bit of green underneath it. I can visually see that it's alive too, but anything that you're actually concerned about in that regard, I don't have any deciduous plants up here. Find out if it's flexible. If it's still flexible, it's likely alive. You can do the thumbnail scratching and see if there's a little bit of green layer underneath the bark. That's a good sign that it's still alive. Things will leaf out at different rates. We always had things, uh, when I worked at the garden center as a kid, we would have things returned uh, in mid-April. I don't think we'd have things returned in mid-April anymore. Everything leaves out super early now. I've got a, I've got a, there's a Wajilia question coming up and I looked over here as I was, um, you know, talking about what, inspecting whether something's dead. It's leafed out already. Uh, I've got, we've got all kinds of deciduous things and it's March, whatever it is, as I'm filming this sixth, uh, something like that. And you know, my osmanthus, I was talking about the osmanthus and I looked over there and it's got four inches of new growth on it, March 6th. Um, so we're likely going to get another frost or freeze. That's going to knock back some of these things that are leafing out a little too early, but that's, that's life. Uh, but yeah, you know, that, this is one of those things, your, your beauty berry will be absolutely fine. And the first time that can, that happens, I'm sure, as a new gardener that you bought something that's deciduous, it probably can be a little bit like, what happened? Uh, so somebody has Everillo Carex in zone 8A in North Carolina. It got little plumes on it. Uh, should they prune them off? So my, the Odd Jobs video this week, I showed the Everillo Carex back here being pruned. They're hardy in zone five to nine, and typically here in zone 7B, eight, nine, uh, we don't prune them in the winter. We don't have to prune them coming out of winter, but mine were kind of had some brown on them. So I went ahead and pruned them back. As a result of pruning them back, I cut all those plumes off. But yeah, Carex do flower. Uh, and uh, some of them are actually quite decorative, uh, interesting flowers. Uh, as well. And there's, again, there's 2,000 species of Carex. So look, there's a Carex, there are Carex that do all kinds of different things. Uh, but that, um, I'm trying to think of that species right now. If I remember it, I'll write it here on the screen as so, the really, really decorative flowers. The ones on the Everillo Carex are little, just little white plumes that stick up about this tall, look like, you know, bl plumes on other types of grasses, but it's not, it's not a, technically a grass, but a grass-like plume. Uh, and you don't have to cut them off. If your Carex are in good shape, you don't have to do anything to them. Uh, if they're really, really rough coming out of winter, you might want to give them a haircut like you do Liriope and other grasses and grass-like things coming out of winter. Okay, uh, so I said, okay, the, uh, last week I was talking about cane growth um, on uh, some plants. And so there's some plants that produce you know, basically canes uh, from the ground that get replaced. And so the, you know, blackberries and raspberries are a great example of that. And then you'll see it in Nandinas, you'll see it in lots of shrubs uh, and forsythia. will produce little canes basically uh, down, down at the base. Um, and then I had mentioned blueberry cane growth. Um, and then I, th this person said, did I mean blackberries or raspberries? Actually, because their blueberries look like just shrubs. Your blueberries will eventually have cane-like growth from the base as well, and that's how they get pruned uh, in the future. Is you'll take out the oldest, uh, the oldest canes uh, coming out of winter, um, 
in the future, but you'll, you'll notice it initially it's a rooted cutting that was grown as a shrub in a nursery container. Uh, but over time, it will start to produce those kind of canes at, down at the bottom. They don't always look the same, like blackberries or raspberry canes look, where they might come up a foot from the plant over here. They'll come up probably a little bit closer to the base until in the future they can really colonize if you're not taking cutting some of those canes out. But uh, blueberries tend to bloom and produce berries the best on wood that's between like two and maybe five years old. After that, those, that individual part of the plant needs to be cut down to the ground when they're five or six years old and they'll produce those new pieces, those new shoots and those new more vigorous juvenile growth produce the best fruit, um, that vigorous new growth. Okay, somebody has tall pines in the Piedmont of North Carolina and want some screening trees in the morning sun. We have great uh, native uh, plants for this and some a few non-natives I'd throw out as well. Elysium for sure. I've got Elysium parviflorum back here and it is about nine feet tall and it's in the, uh, it, it occurs, it, it's in quite a few videos and it'll bloom in the next few weeks in all likelihood. There's a Mahonia, a Marvel Mahonia directly in front of it. Also a great choice. You can use camellias. So the Mahonia and the camellias, not native, but the Elysium, wax myrtles, uh, well, what else? Uh, inkberry hollies uh, could work if you just let them grow because they can get quite big uh, if, you just, if you just let them grow. So there are some native and non-native uh, options that will grow in the understory of pine shade without any problem. Pine shade is pretty good normally, unless the pines are super close together. Pine shade is usually elevated a little bit more uh, and allows light to bounce around uh, in the understory uh, a little more. Uh, and then there's there's English laurels and um, uh, something like West Coast laurel. There's a good amount of uh, Elysium floridanum too, like that Florida sunshine Elysium uh, that I show off quite a bit. There are a lot of plants that will work in a pine understory to create a screen and I would use a mixed border screen. I've talked about that a lot over the years. Don't go all in on one thing. Uh, so somebody pulled out their old landscape fabric um, and I'm sure that was quite a job because it becomes quite a job uh, once it lays there for a while. And they just replaced that mulch that was originally on top of it right back in place. Um, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's about 12 months old. Should they add more mulch? Um, you know, this is interesting because that landscape fabric probably kind of stopped the process of soil improvement and there was probably anaerobic conditions underneath it. So you don't have probably those beneficial bacteria and those beneficial fungi that can really get started breaking that mulch down. So you're probably seeing the results of having had that fabric down for a minute, but those things are gonna come back and their engine is gonna start going pretty quick and it's probably gonna start knocking that mulch down pretty quick. As soon as it's fairly thin, I'd go ahead and mulch pretty quick because all that soil disturbance you did even though your mulch looks good, it's gonna have a lot of weed seeds up in it because of all the, all the struggle. <laughs> and it's a, it's a real struggle because I've pulled up a lot of landscape fabric. Uh, it's a real struggle. So I know that there's gonna be weed seeds in it and here in the month of March is when those weed seeds tend to germinate. So I'm a little nervous for you in that regard, but I don't wanna bury, I don't wanna have too much mulch in place uh, at the same time. So. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough call. If it was only two or three inches thick, I might put a little bit of a mulch cap across the top of it just to maybe prevent a few weeds from germinating. If it's still like three, four, five inches thick, I don't wanna make it any thicker than that and I wanna get that stuff breaking down a bit. That soil's gonna wake back up, especially this spring as the, as the temperature, as the soil temperature starts to come back up to 65, 70 degrees, that soil microbe activity is really gonna kick in. And that's when you're gonna finally start to see mulch break down properly in your new plastic free beds. Uh, so somebody said, what does the presence of earthworms and grubs tell you about the soil? They have loads of worms and a few grubs. We have some grubs out here too. Grubs can be, you know, beetle grubs are interesting. Some are Japanese beetles. If you have big lawn areas, you know, and, um, you tend to be Japanese beetles, and then there's other types of grubs that are other types of beetles that you know, aren't really that big of a deal. They're all probably snacking on some roots on your plants out there, but you know, unless they're out of control, 
you know, they're really not that big of a deal. Um, the question about what the earthworms tell you about your soil uh, is kind of hard to answer because, you know, most of the earthworms that we have up in the Northeast, uh, they're actually European earthworms. They were brought here. Uh, you know, people are concerned about these jet, these jumping worms, these Asian jumping worms that are in their soils and others are like, like they're the only invasive worms, but actually we have European, um, what most of us are seeing in our soil is European, uh, European worms that were brought here. Um, what worms do is they break down some of the bigger materials once they start to decay, leaf material, you know, any organic material and start that process of taking something that's maybe a little bit larger, termites, you know, up at the top, breaking down real, you know, heavier stuff. And then as that stuff breaks down, they're in line, they got, they got their space in line, right? But the soils function just fine in the Northeast uh, before earthworms were introduced in it. Uh, it probably, it's a slower process. So things stack on top of themselves quite a bit more. You know, the boreal forest has, has a very deep layer of, of dead organic material that is breaking down much slower than it would with or with earthworms. So you, you can have healthy soils without earthworms. That's, that, that's my point of saying all that. That's not an issue, but earthworms will help break things down quicker, which again will help those beneficial bacteria, microbes, everything in the system work a little faster. You know, um, and so their presence in the soil, also they're aerating the soil. And another thing they can really do uh, that I've noticed over all these years of doing this is I, I'm only putting, I'm not tilling anything down in the soil. So what I'm doing is building organic material up on the top of the soil and then it's breaking down via earthworms um, and all of these microbes are breaking it down. But then when I dig in my soil, when I get to where that clay layer was, that clay layer no longer looks like it originally did. So not only am I improving this layer up on top, it appears that the worms are carrying this material up and down through the soil, through my deeper into the soil and creating, instead of the, the four inches of, of humus that I've added, or three inches of humus that I've added to the top, they've improved the next three, four, five inches. So by protecting them from the direct sun and keeping the ground moist, you know, using mulch and that kind of thing, uh, they do a lot to improve our soils. But are they the 100% sign that, you know, you have to have them? No, um, but they are beneficial uh, in speeding up the process. Uh, grubs are just kind of all over the place. Some people would tell you kill all grubs because most, I mean, most, a lot of them are Japanese beetles, potentially. Uh, the, the, white, the big white grubs that you're seeing, but they're good food for the birds. The birds are out here, you know, finding a lot of those grubs and, uh, you know, beetles make up, I can't even remember, some crazy percentage of all species that have ever been named are beetles, something like 20%. And I may be wrong as I'm saying that, but it's a big percentage of all species. So we're, we're, we're living with beetles and, and lots of different kinds of beetles. So somebody has a 20 year old rhododendron with thin leaves. Uh, can they rejuvenate, they rejuvenate prune after it flowers uh, in New Jersey? So after this big rhododendron flowers, you know, would it benefit from being like cut in half, you know, to produce new foliage down in the middle? I had a neighbor do that around the corner. Rhod We're on the edge of where big leaf uh, rhododendron uh, do really well here. Tend to be up toward the mountains and then a little up north where this person is in New Jersey, where they do a little bit better, but we have some in the neighborhood and, and some of them are quite vigorous and healthy. I had a neighbor hard prune theirs during COVID and I think it'll be just this year that they're gonna flower again. So it took two to three years for those even mature plants with big root systems under them to mature or to, to, to reestablish themselves. They look great. So yes, absolutely, you can rejuvenation prune them, but keep in mind, slower growing things like rhodo, rhododendrons, camellias, and some other shrubs, when you hard prune them, it's like a two, three year thing before they come back. And again, you may follow what I said on the other question earlier about the osmanthus, and maybe try tip pruning it the first go round. 
uh, and see if that gets a little more air down in it, or I mean a little more light down in it, and that pruning stimulates some in dormant buds down in it that can, um, that can branch out and grow and maybe not have to do that whole wait two, three years <laughs> for it to get back to the point where it's blooming heavily again. But my neighbors look amazing. But I'm thinking it's three years uh, since they pruned them that hard. And when they pruned them that hard, I went, well, they're doomed. That's it. I, I wrote them off uh, because he, here in Raleigh, they're already under a lot of heat stress, but uh, they did just fine. Uh, so somebody has perennial frost heave of with some May night salvia. There are a few other um, frost heave questions I've seen on other videos and possibly even the, the, the Q and A. Sometimes you have to dig, the, you know, when, when the frost, you know, the ice expands when it freezes. And so folks that have uh, soils that freeze a little deeper, you know, things can be pushed out of the ground. Things can be moved around. Uh, concrete can be busted and all kinds of things that people know in the north can happen with the force of water in the wintertime. Um, you have to play it plant by plant as to how you handle uh, frost heave, but th these are May this question was about May night salvia, which is just a perennial salvia. Um, should they replant it or leave it raised up above the soil? I probably would replant it. Uh, those are blooms super early in the spring, so you need to get on it faster, you know, pretty quick. I'd pop that thing out of the ground and kind of replant it like you had it before. Hopefully it'll have enough time to root in this year and secure itself a little better from maybe that happening as much in the future. Uh, so somebody asked, a retired nurseryman who doesn't like tags out in their garden um, asked, what is our method of keeping track of plants? Uh, so we, uh, Steph will map, Steph is a um, landscape design major and she has maps of the garden uh, that we basically hand-drawn maps uh, with all the plants on them and then so they wanted to know if we just had, you know, use computers and that kind of thing. You can see from my question and answer right here, I'm a big tech person. Uh, and I get asked sometimes about why I wanted to, why I started this YouTube thing, which had nothing to do with a career in YouTube or anything. It had to do with, I was trying to teach people about the plants I was selling them at my garden center. You know, the first bunch of videos I made were just for the plants that I was growing at the nursery and selling at the garden center. And I could end the sale by saying, hey, I got a video for that. And then people started watching them from other places and I started making more of them and I got more comfortable making more of them. Those are awful if you're watching them probably. If you, if you found the channel and from one of those and stuck around, thank you very much. But those are, uh, uh, you know, that's, that, that's, how I, uh, um, that's how I started the channel. And also I had a love of tech. So I, I do love cameras, you know, I'm, you know, monitoring this camera from my phone right here. And, you know, I love tech things. I always have. And so this YouTube thing combined that love of tech and this love of gardening and my career in gardening uh, together nicely. My, my time as a nurseryman, my time as a landscaper, my time as, uh, you know, in the garden center and, and that kind of thing. And as a business owner, all those things tied together really nicely. But at the end of the day, I actually like writing things down. I'm not gonna, you know, you, somebody suggest, you laughed one time that I should have an iPad or something like that. I like to write things down. It helps me remember them um, better. That the act of, of look, reading one of your questions and writing it down in one of these little blue books helps me think about it while I'm writing it. Um, think about how I would answer it, how best to answer it, where I hope someone will understand, you know, what, what I'm saying, that kind of thing. And it's the same thing for the maps and the garden and the list of the plants. I, I like to write them down. I probably should have them in some sort of computer um, program. Uh, and I'm on a computer all the time, but I, I prefer, again, I, I love writing things. Uh, I still do. Uh, so somebody asked thoughts on mushroom compost. They live near a mushroom, far, uh, in a mushroom farming area. Um, they know it's good for vegetables, but is it good for other plants? Yeah, you can absolutely, you can mulch with that mushroom compost if you want to and uh, definitely use it for the best uses for those kind of compost are definitely gonna be your vegetable garden in any of your annual beds. You know, if you're growing pansies in the winter or spring or fall or whatever, and then, you know, whatever summer flowering, flowering things you have, those flower beds would definitely love uh, that mushroom compost. And of course you can use it as, you know, some sort of thin layer 
uh, before you till for a lawn. You can use it in the thicker layer out in your beds before when you're creating new beds and it'll get mixed in as you plant the plants. But yeah, it's good material for sure. Uh, somebody wanted to know if it's time to plant Carex bulbs. They're in 6B, Connecticut. They're planting Carex under an oak with dappled light. And there are Carex. The funny thing with Carex, when you say, when you throw out the word Carex, again, I said earlier, two, you know, 2,000 species. There are Carex that grow in the water, as in the Everglades. Uh, and then there's Carex that grow in dry forest shade conditions. And they are all over the planet. And they've evolved to grow in all kinds of different conditions. There's a Carex for almost every spot in the understory. And it's kind of funny because people just ignored these little grass-like plants in these woodland areas for all this time until now. And now it's like the, the world's gone Carex crazy, which is great because there's tons of, we have 500 native species in, in North America alone uh, that we could lean on. And then uh, a bunch of European ones that are, com are coming as well that uh, uh, are not invasive. So um, Int great plants to use. Uh, if you're plant, if you're saying pl by plugs, you're meaning you're buying like a 50 cell tray or a 36 cell tray, uh, and they're that small. I might wait until around my average last frost date to put those in the ground, uh, just because, um, just out of some safety uh, concerns. Not necessarily because of the cold, because they're most of them are hardy in zone five to nine, but just where you got them from. If you got a tray of Carex from someplace, it may, may have gotten shipped in from somewhere that was quite a bit warmer, and they may be a little ahead of your area. So just thinking through that, if they're a little ahead of where they would be in your area, where they still should be very, very dormant without any new growth coming up on them, uh, I would wait until your average last frost break, which in 6B Connecticut is probably third week of April, maybe fourth week of April, something like that. Uh, let's see, somebody wants a camellia in zone 5B New York. Uh, it's in a, obviously in a container. You can't plant, um, there aren't hardy camellias up in zone 5B uh, in New York. They want to know if it's best to overwinter one in an unheated garage or a sunroom that stays between 50 and 55. I think your sunroom is definitely going to be the place to be. Your garage is probably not going to have enough light. Um, you know, in these, even though they're part shade plants, they would still, I have not, I got a camellia off the screen over there. Oh, there's one right there. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a camellia right here. They are typically triggered to flower by uh, some cool nights. And so don't stick it directly in your sunroom uh, super, super early. Uh, you'll want to have this, I, I would imagine, 5B New York, you're going to start having some cool nights in September. That's what's going to trigger it flowering, and you want to leave it outside as long as possible. This thing can take pretty cold temperatures, um, you know, down to 30 in this container, uh, 28 or something like that in this container, probably without having, having any real harm done to it. So leave it out as long as you can, and then bring it into the sunroom when you get, you know, real winter, you know, real winter kind of sets in and then get it back out as soon as possible. I would imagine in 5B New York, I'm outside and I could be in shorts and short sleeves today. You know, if you're up and back up in the 50s or something, I'd get it back outside as quick as possible. But your sunroom is definitely better um, for the light. Okay, and oh, and then they ask each season, should they put it in the ground or keep it in the pot? I'd keep it in the pot so you're not constantly digging it up and moving it constantly. Um, let's see, number 20. Somebody's wajilia looks dead with no growth and dried up buds. Do they sleep late? And that's weird because I just answered that. Mine is leafing out a little earlier than I would have expected. I don't know what zone this person was in. I don't know if it said it in the question and, I, uh, and uh, we didn't write it down. But um, no, it's wajilia should be just waking up um, now over the course of the next month again things are waking up a little earlier than normal but if you're concerned about your deciduous plants on whether they're alive again go out there and bend a limb you know if it breaks then you know that's that's pretty much a sure sign that it, at least that part of the plant's dried out and even that doesn't mean it's dead it could be alive down near the base somewhere and come back out from that uh, but they're pretty tough plants wajila are pretty much you know zone five hardy plants and so unlikely it's dead but uh, be patient uh, i have to say this be patient on deciduous things coming out of dormancy especially things that you may have planted late uh, or planted in an inopportune time last year 
something that's newer, some change that was made around it. Um, some things can wake up a little later than others and they don't all, you know, it's not like every deciduous plant wakes up at the same time. Some of our perennial, some of our dormant perennials are smart enough to stay dormant while other ones are, you know, already up and really growing really quickly. I've got an acanthus back there and some other things that are just like, I'm just, oh, I'm gonna be two feet tall, you know, a month early uh, for, for no good reason. While I haven't seen a hosta, well, I see one little hosta over here that's up about two inches. So the perennials are at different rates. The deciduous plants are at different rates. The evergreen plants really will be at different rates of whether or not, you know, the new growth on this, you know, this cephalotaxis hasn't even thought about, not even thinking about growing uh, at all. And this loripetalum that's in front of it starting to put out flower buds and new growth on it. You know, they're side by side. Uh, one of them has jumped out ahead of the other one. Uh, so somebody, um, oh, somebody asked about where to get triple shredded hardwood mulch in the Raleigh area. And I just wrote, I wrote this down because uh, everybody's got landscape yards uh, near them in all likelihood. Landscapers are got to have somewhere that they can go and buy bulk uh, materials. And so um, if you look this up for Raleigh, you're gonna see mulch masters and, uh, uh, several others uh, right here in the triangle area Tri uh, triangle landscape supplies that one just came to mind because i said triangle uh triangle is the raleigh durham chapel hill area but it probably should be the raleigh durham Cary area because Cary's probably bigger than chapel hill at this point the way it's grown uh but that uh um everybody you should have some sort of landscape yard in your area that you can you can call and get them to deliver um hardwood hardwood mulch and i'm getting a load on uh, monday uh, of triple shredded hardwood and I'm getting 12 yards which is probably a couple probably a couple too many the first time I mulched this garden it was 18 yards of triple shredded hardwood minus the paths I pine strawed the paths the first time to differentiate the color this time I've used the, the wood chips it was 18 yards and then I've gone all the way down to eight the last time but that was a little too thin so I've bumped it back up to uh, 12 because my mulch is very thin right now and again, it probably 10 is the right number. You'll find that the amount you need should drop over time if you're continuing to add things to your garden or not, you know, just the other thing, things growing and filling in. Hopefully you use less as time goes on because it's super expensive now. I mean, it's, you know, $28 a yard kind of a thing now. Uh, so sometime, somebody asked the best time to move uh two-year-old peonies in zone seven uh tennessee really the best time is in late summer the it's not great for them as they're emerging my peonies are up about this much at this point over here and they were in a video about dividing and transplanting peonies that's on the channel if you want to see it but really it is late summer is the best time as they're starting that as, as they're starting to fade to dig them up and transplant them uh, so somebody asked if it's okay to plant annuals above dormant bulbs. Yes, absolutely. And I, we talk about that. Anytime I talk about bulbs and design, I like to talk about the fact that they should be integrated into your landscape. Uh, they look best if they're integrated into other things, where, where other perennials come up through them. So they flower all of our hyacinths. And you'll see this week, I'm sure we'll do that odd jobs video. I'll show off more of the bulbs. We have a ton of bulbs out here blooming right now it's quite it's beautiful uh, but we have perennials that come up in and around them and they're around shrubs and other things so after they flower that foliage will take a month and a half sometimes to fade back or two months to fade back and they don't look great so it's nice to have other annuals and perennials and shrubs and other things come up in and around them so it takes away from the fact that they don't look good for a little while Okay, uh, so somebody asked if Harry Lauder's walking sticks, uh, this one's eight years old, are fussy about being transplanted. No, I think you'll be able to transplant it fine. You might find that it's hard to dig out after eight years. I don't know how vigorous it's been uh, over the years, but it may take a bit of effort to, uh, to get it moved. Um, I don't find them to be all that tough of plants, uh, really. I, I love seeing them in the landscape. They used to be Super pricey. I haven't priced one out in a long time, um, so I don't know. They're not the fastest growing things in the world, but after eight years, this thing's probably anchored itself pretty good. Um, 
uh, I think you'll be able to move it just fine, and you can still move it right now while it's dormant. It's probably the best time uh, to do it. Uh, so somebody asked about propagating forsythia by taking stems and just sticking them in the cutting off stems and sticking them in the ground somewhere else. Yeah, that probably will work. Forsythia roots pretty readily. It doesn't mean all of them will work, but if you did enough of them, you could get some of them to work. Might be best if you took them and put them, if you were going to stick a cutting somewhere, might stick it in like a vegetable garden where the soil's been worked a little more over time and let it root out there and then transplant it after it's got some roots on it. But the easiest way would probably be to do like uh, semi-hardwood cuttings in June, that period of time. Uh, they root super readily at that time. And I got a ton of propagation videos on the channel, including Forsythia uh, in the title of them, I'm sure. Uh, but they are, they are pretty easy to root. But it is one you can take a piece and stick it in the ground somewhere. Another option, would be to kind of air layer it. If you take a branch on that forsythia and lay it down to the ground and then kick some leaves or a little bit of soil over that branch uh, and then let the branch just stick up from there, it'll root in right in that spot and then you can cut it away from the parent plant. So that's another way to do it. And that's a 100% chance of rooting it that way. And I've got a method I've done the last couple of years taking containers and bending branches directly into containers. You can go back and look at that video, but forsythia roots pretty easily, a lot of different ways to do it. Somebody got chip drop uh, two years ago of uh, wood chips and life took over and um, you know that happens. Uh, can they still use them? So the pile is still somewhere. Yeah, you can absolutely still use them. You may find it much harder now to uh, to, you know, to use your fork or your shovel or, you know, um, it, it will be harder to work with now that it's been sitting in that compact pile for a long time. It's kind of amazing that it hasn't, I mean, imagine the pile's gotten smaller. I mean, immediately mine started cooking on the driveway. When you have that combination of green leaves uh, and that wood together in a pile like that with a little bit of moisture, it just starts to compost fire going. Uh, I had to get that pile moved quick because it, it just, it gets really, really hot on the interior. Uh, so I would imagine this pile had to have sunk some uh, in the past. If you got some sort of machine to flip it over, that would be the best and get it loose again uh, so that you can move it much easier, but most people don't. Um, so I just expect it to be a little harder, but the chips are absolutely fine to use. Okay, uh, last question for this week. This is number 27. Uh, this was about crepe myrtle scale. Um, they don't have crepe myrtle scale at this time or sooty mold um, on the trees. I've shown crepe myrtle scale several, few times now. I didn't mean to show it this many times, but we have so many crepe myrtles. Every time I leave this house to go film one of these neighborhood walk around tours, I find some weird crepe myrtle thing. Uh, so, uh, and, and the crepe myrtles here are just, there's not a crepe myrtle here that doesn't have scale. Uh, it's, it's incredible. This person's doesn't. They wanted to know if they should go ahead, if dormant oil is an option um, before they leaf out. Yeah, you could spray the trunks with dormant oil if you wanted to, uh, and that is an option for controlling scale. If you don't have it there, I don't, you know, I don't know that it would be a whole lot of benefit, but that is the way in which, peop which people are going to approach this is spraying dormant oil on the trunks uh, to smother. You can smother sca scale insects. Basically, you have these crawler stage, um, where they basically crawl up to the spot on the tree they want to be, usually in a little divot somewhere in a, in a little low spot on the trunk or stem. Uh, and then they just kind of burrow in there and then they, perform, they have this little hard shell that protects them on the outside. Uh, dormant oil just kind of smothers them in place. Uh, we used a lot of dormant oil at the nursery. It was a great method for scale, you know, scale insects like T-scale on camellias camellias in the T family, so um, we call it the scale that they get. We call it T scale. There's a magnolia scale that we would have all you know, quite frequently and other scales, and we would use dormant oil uh, this time of year uh, on them. Be careful with dormant oil when in hotter times of the year, for sure, because you can, <laughs> that oil can actually cook things <laughs> if you use it at the, at the wrong time. So, uh, uh, but yeah, you can use it. I don't know if it's it gonna do you, it's not a prevention thing. So I don't know where we're going with this crepe myrtle scale thing. I guess people are going to use tons of um, systemic insecticide drenches. I think people are going to be pouring 
lots of systemic insecticides at the base of these things so that these anything that attaches or tries to eat it is going to die. I imagine that's the, and then we're gonna be using dormant oils in the winter time and it will be an all out thing to save the crepe myrtles like it was with the um, leaf spot on the, on the uh, red tip fetinias and other things that come along. You know, we, uh, uh, the garden center I worked at as a kid, man, we sold so much daconil, which was the fungicide that people were using to try to treat the leaf spot disease on the red tip fetinia when the, and then all you know the fetinia went from having a few spots to having a lot of spots to defoliating to dead in like four years uh, during that four years it was like a and i don't know that that's what where we're going with this crepe myrtle scale thing but it was we sold a lot of daconil during that time uh, cases and cases and cases of it with people trying to save their beautiful what were beautiful screening shrubs uh, that had been vastly overplanted but I, I don't know where this crepe myrtle scale thing. It was on like two or three plants two, three years ago. Um, I, you know, where I have coffee over here in the morning, there was one outside there that, you know, was the first time I saw crepe myrtle scale in Raleigh. And now this, maybe three winters later, it's on every single one. At one point, I thought only it was the dark. It was the, the, the crepe myrtles that had the dark bark seem to have it worse than the ones that had lighter colored bark and now that doesn't that's not a thing for a little while i was like oh, but, hmm, this is a thing i think and no it's not a thing they all seem to uh, have it um everywhere here in the city so i don't know where this is going uh, uh but it's definitely uh not a pretty sight for a lot of these crepe myrtles that are in in, in my area Thank you guys so much for participating. Again, ask gardening questions down in the comment section below. Uh, include your zone if it seems relevant, uh, your um, USDA hardiness, you know, from the USDA hardiness zone map, because uh, sometimes that's helpful in answering your gardening questions. Again, next week, uh, there will be a uh, announcement for something we have uh, upcoming over on my uh, website. And um, after that, a uh, bigger announcement a little bit later, uh, in the uh, spring uh, that I'm pretty excited about this just uh, uh, just developing now. So thank you guys very much for watching and following along with the channel.